Welcome. Welcome to this evening's program. My name is Barbara Dickinson. I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome you all here tonight. I'm the executive director of the Friends of the Hanley Regional Library. Uh, the Friends have been around since 1977. They, a group formed to support uh, the Hanley Library at that time, and that has grown into the Hanley Regional Library System. The Friends support the libraries by sometimes raising funds, but have always, always been involved with bringing great programs free to the public like this event we're going to be enjoying this evening. Um, sometimes we have to get grants and I have a little bit of business to read as we get the evening started. Uh, the funding has been provided by Virginia Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act Economic Stabilization Plan of 2020. Now it's my pleasure to introduce a couple people who are helping bring this program to you tonight. One is our tech guru, Katie Moss. She is uh, the Youth Services Supervisor at Hanley Regional Library System. And of course, my great pleasure to introduce our guide for this evening, Todd Strader. Todd is an author of children's books and a fan of wolves, as you might guess. Um, his latest book project, The Story of a Red Wolf, has brought together his passion for storytelling and his love for wolves. This program is part of an effort on his part to bring attention to this critically endangered species. Take it away, Todd. Not the most tech savvy in the world. There we go. Can everyone hear me? All right. Thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, yeah, so um, this evening uh, was my idea. Um, I uh, First of all, let me just uh, thank everyone for being here. Uh, we had tremendous interest in this program, and I'm so pleased to see that. So thank you all for joining us if you're on Zoom or if you're joining us by uh, Facebook uh, Live. We are so glad to have you. I know we have a lot of SU students with us tonight. So, hey, welcome to you guys and some GMU students as well. So, hey, welcome to you guys as well. Uh, yeah, so like I said, uh, this was my idea. I'm just a guy who loves wolves and I, I love to promote um, human animal relationships that are respectful and compassionate. So that kind of leads me to do things uh, like this. As Barbara mentioned, uh, I am an author. And currently I have a project uh, that uh, we're, get, uh, we're trying to get out. And uh, that is a book that uh, features um, a red wolf. Uh, it's a retelling, a fractured retelling of Riding Hood, uh, where the wolf is the hero of the story uh, in juxtaposition to the traditional telling of the story. And I mention that uh, because it was that project that specifically linked me to the red wolf cause. If you're not familiar with red wolves, uh, they are a species of wolf that are, that have only ever existed in the United States. You know, Australia has the pandas that's, that's synonymous with Australia. You think of China, uh, did I say pandas? I meant the koalas. You think of China, you think of pandas. Well, we have the red wolves, but unlike the others, not even our own people really know a lot about this elusive species. Uh, so uh, tonight will be an opportunity to introduce them to you. Unfortunately, uh, right now they are in great peril. At one time they ranged uh, throughout the East Coast from the Northeast down the Mid-Atlantic Coast as far south as Florida and as far as west as Texas. Um, and in the late 70s, early 80s, they went extinct in the wild. Um, and we brought them back and now they're about to do so again. But the, the film we're about to show you, the documentary um, made by Running Wild Media is gonna explain all about that. So I'm not gonna get into it. We'll let the film do that. Uh, but I do wanna kind of lay out how this evening is going to pro progress. So the first thing we're gonna do is share the film with you. Uh, and then after that, uh, we've got the two filmmakers here with us, uh, Justin Grubbs and Alex Goats are here with us uh, this evening and they're gonna talk about their experience with the film and share some uh, thoughts with us. Uh, and then after that, we also have another special uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Nutrin Songsansen is with us uh, this evening uh, and she is with the Smithsonian Center for Biology and Conservation Institute. 
Uh, and uh, so she is going to also be uh, one of our presenters this evening. We're very honored to have her. I will say very quickly why I am, what the tie-in is uh, for, for the two. Um, there's a group of organizations that have gotten together explicitly for the purpose of trying to find long-term strategies uh, to save critically endangered species of wildlife. And they have combined uh, their, their powers together to uh, do a lot of initiatives that have really made some, some true progress in that area. And, and that group is called, um, for short, it's C2S2, and that stands for Conservation Centers for C Species Survival. And uh, the Biology Institute Smithsonian is one of the five core members of that, and that group has been very instrumental in supporting the film that you're about to see. So that's kind of the tie-in uh, with those two. Once we've heard from Dr. Song Sanson, then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Uh, we're going to do that through the comments. So if you're on Zoom, you can comment in the uh, Zoom comments, or if you are joining us via Facebook Live, you can just uh, put it in the Facebook comments. And uh, we're going to be monitoring those and bringing those up uh, to our presenters. Uh, so that'll be um, later on. Okay, so what we want to do now is get to the film. Uh, before I do that, let me mention just a couple of things. The play quality is going to depend a lot upon the device that you're using and what your interconnect, internet connection is. We're going to be streaming from the platform Vimeo. We're going to be streaming into Zoom uh, on our share screen. And then from there, it's going to also be broadcast to Facebook Live. Uh, so there's a couple of junctures there. Um, for best playability on your system, a couple recommendations. Uh, one is that if you have some other programs running, anything running in the background that you can shut down, you might want to do that. Uh, you definitely want to pump up your volume. And if it's an issue, if you think you might have some trouble with that playback, uh, we're going to put the link directly to the film in Vimeo in the comments. That way, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do it while I speak. If I can chew gum and speak at the same time, we're about to find out. Um, you can go out, hit the link, and then watch it, and then come back into Zoom or come back into Facebook, uh, whichever works for you. Give me one second. And tell you what, Barbara, I just posted it in Zoom. Can you transfer that over to, uh, to Facebook? Or you want me to see if I can't do that real quick? Actually, I think I shut Facebook down. Oh, I, I can do it. You go on. I'll do it. If it takes me a minute, I can do it. And you can Okay. Continue. So that's going to pop up. Um, and I'm going to Take Barbara and away here for a second, if I can. Yep, bye-bye. And Barbara, let's get you here. There we go. And now I present to you the director's cut of Resilience, the story of the American Red Wolf. It was a 20 year process to get wolves back. Uh, a lot of planning, a lot of public outreach, a lot of scientific research. Uh, but that was done and in 95, 96, 97, we reintroduced 41 wolves. I mean, it really has flipped Yellowstone.
The red wolf is an important test of our will to live with species that may occasionally be inconvenient to us. We are currently uh, standing on the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, and this is where uh, the reintroduction occurred back in 1987 when they released four red wolf pairs. So I'm going to try to track a, a female, a young female. She'll be two in the spring, so she's just shy of a two-year-old. Based on the, the strength of the, the beep, you can kind of get a sense for what direction they are and how far they are. Unfortunately, known red wolf population in the wild here in eastern North Carolina is 12 animals, meaning uh, we have 12 red wolves with radio collars. And we know some that aren't collared, but even adding those in, uh, we still believe that the total population is only about 20 animals. So I didn't pick up signal for that individual. So many people don't realize that red wolves are a thing. The problem we have right now is that our red wolf population is so low. Anybody yeah. here? Dang it. Red wolves once roamed throughout the southeastern United States and numbered in the thousands. But when the human population increased, much of that wilderness was lost. Many people feared the wolf, and those fears led to government-sponsored extermination programs. The red wolf was first listed as in danger of extinction under the Endangered Species Preservation Act in 1967. And between 1973 and 1980, the few remaining red wolves were captured to begin a captive breeding program. Those fears led to, to their extermination. The new goal was to rebuild the red wolf population. But in 1980, they were officially declared extinct in the wild. This meant that the entire survival of the species was dependent upon managed breeding programs. They did that to try and get the numbers up and then release them back onto the landscape. After a few years, these new wolves were ready to experience the wild for the first time and were transported nearly 3,000 miles to their new home. Nothing like this had ever been done before with a large carnivore species with the intention of getting the numbers up and releasing them back onto the landscape to save an endangered species. Before release, the wolves are outfitted with radio collars. The radio permitted hands-off monitoring of the wolves since each collar contains a transmitter which will help locate the wolf on the landscape. It was the first reintroduction for a large carnivore on the landscape. This happened eight years before the gray wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone. The innovative techniques that were developed as part of the red wolf recovery program led to the successful reintroduction of red wolves in North Carolina. But not only did it do that, it paved the way for other gray wolf, Mexican wolf reintroduction programs. For decades, the Red Wolf program flourished. The Red Wolves grew, they bred, they got up to almost about 150 Red Wolves in the wild. Just a few years ago, some anti-wolf movement spreading misinformation really 
changed that landscape there for them and made it very hard to do conservation. In the last 10 years, the, the greatest mortality to red wolves is human caused, uh, first being gunshot mortality, either mistaken identity or intentional, and also we have a lot of vehicle strikes. Some private landowners feel like the red wolf is restricting their, their right to manage their lands. It's incumbent upon us to do a better job of, of being out there with public education and outreach. What we need to find is a balance where you know, they don't have to be strong supporters of the Red Wolf Recovery Program, but, but what we need is tolerance, really. You think of what we've dealt with in our culture, you know, portraying this wolf as the big bad wolf. And that's our job, is to be able to talk about what wolves are actually like. There has never been a reported case of an injury uh, from a Red Wolf, or, or even, you know, really a direct threat. The level of depredation that was feared and it continues to be feared today is just not played out. All of us that are working on this Red Wolf Recovery Program, we, we value this species greatly. It's hard for us sometimes morale-wise to see the species where it's at. It's just ingrained how fortunate we are to be here putting forth this effort and seeing an animal we just we kind of stop and think about. You know, there are so few of these in the world and here we have the opportunity to, to be here. We're here near Yellowstone National Park because the Gray Wolf Ranch ejection that happened here in 1995 was built on what was learned from the Red Wolf Reintroduction Project that happened in the 1980s. Our project here came after the Red Wolf Reintroduction. So what they did had tremendous value for what we did. It's very important to spread this word that wolves aren't what people used to think but they are very important inhabitants to ecosystems. So wolves are a keystone species, so their absence in the environment changes a lot of things. So you have predators at the top, and wolves are the dominant North American predator. And so they feed on the next level down, which are the plant eaters, elk and deer, moose and bison, things like that, and they impact the plants. So nature is all interconnected. And when you take those few species out at the top, it changes everything. And what people did is we came along and we took them out. And so when you don't have these carnivores, the plant eaters population explode and they overeat the vegetation. When they overeat the vegetation, any other animal that uses that vegetation doesn't have habitat. A lot of people think things like they're going to decimate prey populations, they're going to decimate livestock, and what we've seen with recovery efforts is that that's not actually the case. Wolf predation is built on vulnerability and weakness. In general, they cannot go out and kill any elk or deer. If that animal's healthy, their chances of killing it are very low. In fact, in Yellowstone, wolf success rate on elk is five to 15%. They live on the weak animals. It's a myth that wolves show up and my hunting is gone. Your hunting may be better. Humans tend to take the healthy. Wolves tend to take the weak. By removing that sick animal from the herd, it's removing that disease from being spread to the rest of the herd. And there's also some evidence that that disease, blue tongue, brucellosis, by removing those diseases from the landscape, they can actually stop that from transmitting to our livestock. We are seeing change with wolves coming back. These top carnivores have very important ecological functions. That's the important thing about red wolf recovery. By restoring American red wolves back to the southeastern United States, we can restore balance to their ecosystem. The biggest thing I want people to know about red wolves, quite honestly, is that they actually exist. You know, I live here locally and, 
And even talking to my neighbors, uh, most of them do not know that Red Bulls exist, and they certainly didn't know they exist within a half an hour drive of where they live. So, uh, you know, it's incumbent upon us to get that message out. find these guys for my own peace of mind, because I know they're here. So that is uh, the male wolf 2186, uh, born in 2016. We do need to get the word out about how wonderful they are and, and that we hope to preserve and, and grow this population both locally and hopefully in the future, you know, in other areas so we can have a true wild population. The Red Wolf Species Survival Plan is made up of 43 institutions across the United States that are all working together to help save the American Red Wolf. By breeding animals in enclosures that can be re-released one day, conducting important research on Red Wolf behavior and educating the public, they help spread awareness about this amazing species. In managed care, animal care staff across the various institutions raise the red wolves in a way that does not habituate them to humans by avoiding contact with the red wolves. Wolves are naturally afraid of people, and that's a huge survival skill that we want to make sure they maintain. So when they get the call to be released back out into the wild, they have survival skills to not only stay away from people, but we feed them natural prey like white-tailed deer. They have puppies, so they learn how to raise a litter, and they learn how to be a pack, a family that can survive out in the wild. The only time animal care staff is hands-on is to administer a vaccine. Thank you guys all for coming in early today. I know it is a bummer waking up at four in the morning. Pretty much all of our pup checks are gonna be like this, if not earlier. We are catching the adults, um, Artemis and Oka, really quickly. We're gonna form a line, and our goal is to either get in the den box or into the holding areas. And while it is a little intimidating for the pups, it reinforces a wolf's natural inclination to run away from humans. Nice job. Ready? It's a little one. It's a little one. What these pups represent is hope for the American red wolf. Every pup born in the breeding program has a chance to help with the future reintroduction of the red wolf back into its native habitat. For the first time since 2009, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has the opportunity to release wolves born in the captive breeding program into Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Off the coast of Florida, on a semi-wild island managed breeding site called St. Vincent National Wildlife Refuge, a male wolf is prepared for its journey to North Carolina. It's something we've been wanting to do 
for several years, but we finally, this, everything was aligned. We were able to capture the juvenile male from St. Vincent and a female in West Milltail here on Alligator River. And so the original plan was to put him into acclimation pen like the one you see behind me. So you'd have a, a wolf new to that area and a wolf that was in that territory. And that way they would imprint on each other and the animal new to the area would be more likely to stay in this area. And then we would release them in hopes that they would create a new breeding pair. They're both in this one. This pair has been together for a little over two weeks. Uh, we wanted them to be together a little longer, but uh, we didn't capture a milltail animal until kind of late in the season, and we're we're concerned about keeping them in the pen uh, too much longer. So we're gonna we're gonna release them today. So as I mentioned before, we had no breeding pairs in the wild here in eastern North Carolina, and no red wolf pups born in the wild. So. Um, we're concerned about the population status and that we will just keep declining and declining. This is our best chance at red wolf pups in the wild. And then kind of an interesting twist as well, we captured the daughter of the, the female red wolf that's in the pen. And we want to release her kind of close in time and proximity to the mother so that she uh, as well will accept the, the, new, the new wolf. And of course the hope is that they're all three stay together and that they will bond and become you know, the new core of the, the milltail pack. So we'll peel back this whole side of the pen open to the field and then open the den box and then when they're ready they'll come out and that's why it's called a soft release. We're not kicking them out. We're just holding them here and then letting them leave on their own and hope that they stay in this territory and stay together. But you never know what's going to happen. They definitely are friendly with each other but who knows if they're going to stay together or go their separate ways. Or it's all just kind of uh, wait and see at this point. Hope for the best. Okay, I'm opening it. He's out of the box. I think that went incredibly well, actually. Um, you know, they were a little reluctant to come out at first, but uh, pretty awesome. I got to admit, uh, watching that uh, wolf from St. Vincent, especially taking his first uh, wild steps on Alligator River, especially the way the flowers are blooming right now, is a, is a pretty beautiful sight. So that was pretty spectacular, I think. I don't know that it could have gone any better. And uh, kind of overwhelming that uh, three months of uh, intense effort uh, led to this. And I Looks like they stayed together, at least in the short term, so we're, we're hoping that's the way it goes and that uh, the, the rest of their time together in this pack goes as well as their, their soft release did, so that's that. The people of the Fish and Wildlife Service and myself and the biologists 
we believe in the species. We have dedicated years, uh, some of us, you know, a few years, some of us 30 years of our lives to this species. And this country it would be remiss to not have this species on the ground. What conservation organizations are working towards now is to help bring this species back to the southeastern United States, to help restore the American landscape. Our vision is a place where we have red wolves in the future, where my kids can go out into the wild and hear a red wolf howl. Think about how often we talk to other countries and say, you need to save your rhino or your elephant. And here in our own backyard, the red wolf is one of the most endangered mammals in the entire planet. Restoring the red wolf back to the American landscape will create a healthier environment for every living thing. This is a real test for our will to live with other species. And so the red wolf really is a touchstone for this idea. I mean, really the fundamental question is, do humans have a right to take over the planet? There we go. Okay, so that very well put together documentary was made by Running Wild Media. Uh, I think it does an excellent job of introducing you to this very beautiful species, of kind of outlining what the history of the recovery efforts have been and who some of the partners have been in both preserving uh, the wolves, uh, both through a uh, species plan in, in captivity, as well as the release into the wild. And then, of course, it really got into some of the debate that surrounds uh, this population and some of the uh, misconceptions, unfortunately, that have been perpetuated. Uh, what I'd like to do now is introduce you to the two guys that are running wild uh, media. Uh, let me brag on them a little bit, and then I'm going to turn things over to them. Uh, they are uh, Alex Goats. Did I say your name right? Uh, it's Gat, but that's all right. I get it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alex Getz, <laughs> uh, who is a two-time Emmy-nominated wildlife filmmaker and photographer, 2016 winner of National Geographic Wild's Wild to Inspire film competition. Uh, he is a native of Ohio, but he doesn't stay put much. Uh, he has trekked around the globe uh, to places like Tasmania, Alaska, the Marshall Islands, uh, road tripping through Africa, all to film wildlife and conservation efforts. Alex is a uh, 2019 Emerging Wildlife Conservation Le Leader, uh, 2019 NAAEE 30 Under 30. Ought to be under 30 again. Uh, TEDx uh, Toledo 2017 speaker. He is a 2013 uh, graduate from Bowling Green State University with degrees in uh, film production and environmental science. Uh, but Justin, hey Justin, uh, not hey. to be outdone, uh, also filmmaker, photographer, and published writer. And I'm going to pause on published writer for just a second. Uh, Justin recently wrote an article for National Wildlife Magazine, uh, which is excellent. I'm going to post a link to that in the comments because I really encourage everyone to check that out. It's, it's worth your time to take a look. Um, 
Justin is a naturalist. He is the co-founder with Alex of Running Wild Media. Uh, I'm going to put that link in the comments as well to your guys' website. Uh, Justin has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Bowling Green State University. I'm seeing a connection there. Uh, currently uh, pursuing his Master's of Biology at Miami University. Justin is a 2017 Emerging, emerging Wildlife Conservation Leader uh, and a National Geographic Wild, Wild to Inspire film uh, competition winner and a member of the Explorers Club. Uh, Justin loves nature. Uh, he has a passion for the outdoors, and he this passion has brought him to some of the most extreme uh, habitats and environments on our planet, all to film critically endangered wildlife like the red wolf. So guys, thank you so much for being here tonight and joining us, and welcome. Thanks for having us. Thanks yeah, for showing the film. <laughs> So uh, looking at your website, uh, you guys have filmed so many different exotic species. And like we just talked about, you've been to all these places throughout the entire world. I'm just kind of curious, what is it that drew your attention to the red wolves here? It's a really Jeff. good question. <laughs> um, we were actually, our attention was brought to the red wolf um, by uh, a couple organizations, Conservation Centers for Species Survival and Endangered Wolf Center. They were looking to do an education film and they were connected to us through a couple people. And they saw that we do a lot of the going out and finding rare and endangered animals. And we do a lot of education programming and films and stuff. And so they brought the, the film idea to our attention and we absolutely loved the idea. Um, we were furiously researching Red Wolf stuff and you know, really keen on making this film. And as we kind of progressed through the production of it and everything, we just fell in love with the species. And so we're continuing our work and everything and working with all of these wonderful partners that we've established throughout the course of this film. But yeah, it was just something that we really, really, really enjoyed and an animal that really needs a lot of good media. So we kind of latched onto it. And I think like you had mentioned, Todd, in the very beginning of this, um, you know, we were already doing wildlife filmmaking before we were approached to do this project. So I like to think that we knew a lot about different species that are out there in the world. Um, but when they approached us about this, I genuinely had no idea that the red wolf even existed, even in the middle of doing wildlife filmmaking. And so like Justin said, you know, once we realized that it was a thing, we just kind of fell in love with it. And the fact that it was just such an overlooked species here in the United States, we just knew that this was like a really great thing to put our time and effort into to really try and get the word out about this animal. It's got such a complicated history. So we were really eager to dive into that and are still keeping up with what's going on and involved in some red wolf efforts and communication efforts. Like tonight. Like tonight. Yeah. Yeah. We're happy to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, I'm going to keep you talking just a little bit longer because uh, I'm wondering in the uh, course of uh, making that documentary, were there any big reveals to you? Hmm. I don't know, Justin. Do you have any, any big reveals? Like while we were making the documentary? Yeah. Or as a result of, during... I think the interesting thing from my perspective, and Justin might have a different one, is that, you know, we started this project in, what was it, 2018, Justin? Um, yes. I think it was 2018. But by the time the film was released it, earlier this year, you know, a lot had changed as far as the wild population went. Like numbers had dropped for uh, various reasons. And you know, we started this project, I think, with the end card saying less than 50 American Red Wolves in the United States in 2018. And then I think by the time that we finished it up, there was estimates of less than 20. Um, so it, I mean, things were happening while we were making it, which made it very challenging. You know, we were in the midst of it and we had to produce a film that was talking about everything that's going on while everything was going on. And so it's like, we actually finished a version that was 15 minutes long. Um, and then right after we had finished editing it, 
they were like, we're, we got to go ahead. We're releasing new wolves in the landscape. And we're like, we can't miss this. We have to re-edit. And so that's where this version came about is just like, it felt like kind of a missing piece that was in this whole story. Cause we talked how, about how important this is to get them out there. So things were happening the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was my my answer to the ending where they were going to release the the new wolf. I mean, that was the first time that they've done that in over a decade. And we were not even anticipating that, you know. And so this is what inspired the director's cut. And as we continue to cover the media of this film and stuff, they are planning on doing more releases and we are planning on covering those as well. So it is very much an ongoing story that we're scrambling <laughs> every moment you know, trying to keep up with what's going on because everything just changes at the last minute. It's, it's a challenge, but it's a lot of fun. Well, that's really outstanding that, uh, that you guys, um, it wasn't a one-off that uh, I really sense a commitment on you guys to keep uh, following this unfolding story uh, and using your talents to share it with us. So, wow, thank you for that. We appreciate it. I, I mean, there's still so many people out there who don't know it exists. And as we continue conversations with people here in the U.S. who tell us that they didn't even know that this species was on the landscape, it just shows, you know, there needs to be more of an effort. We need to keep doing it. Absolutely. And thank you for that, your part in that. Hey, you guys stick around. Uh, we're going to come back with the Q&A, and I'm sure that uh, everyone viewing probably has lots of questions for you. Uh, so I'm going to ask them to hang on to them or put them in the uh, comments. And we're going to move on to our next speaker, and we'll be back to you guys in just a little bit here. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Song Sanson. How are you tonight? I'm great, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs> okay, well, everyone, let me introdu introduce you to Nutrin uh, Song Sanson. I'm probably not getting your name right either. I'm no, sorry. That's perfect. That. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit about our, our, our next special guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Song Sanson is the center head of the Center for Species Survival at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, which I mentioned earlier. And for those of you who are in uh, the service area for um, uh, Hanley Regional Library System, who is hosting and sponsoring tonight's program, uh, you may or may not know just how close by she is. That Smithsonian Center, that, lo that facility is located in nearby Front Royal. Uh, very beautiful, beautiful facility. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing. A little bit more about uh, Dr. Song Sanson. On the science front, uh, she has developed technologies that have allowed scientists to garner, capture valuable genetic material from critically endangered species as a way to assist in the effort to preserve them. Um, so, and if, and if I kind of, I'm a layman, so <laughs> my description of these things is a little off, you'll forgive me. On the organizational front, uh, she has developed partnerships with both uh, national and international government and non-government organizations uh, to conduct together multidisciplinary studies uh, for that same end of preser preserving a critically endangered species. And on the academic front, she has adjunct appointments at uh, the uh, University of Maryland, at Cornell University, and at George Mason University. Shout out to the George Mason students who I hope are still with us. Uh, Dr. Song Sanson uh, is the coordinator of the American Zoological Association's Maine Wolf Sur uh, Species Survival Plan. Uh, she got her uh, doctorate of veterinarian medicine at Kassistar, Kassistart, uh University in Thailand, and her master of science and PhD from the Uni University of Guelph in Canada. Um, so welcome Dr. Song Sanson. <laughs> thank you again for being here. Today. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Yeah. So um, 
there are a great many uh, efforts coming from various disciplines uh, to try and preserve some of these species like uh, the red wolf. Uh, there's activism, uh, there's legislation, uh, there are court battles going on. Uh, there are programs like the one we just saw in the film that are being conducted by the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. But you, you work at preserving a species by preserving its very blueprint, uh, by yeah. capturing for future generations their genetic code. Uh, do I kind of understand that correctly? Is that something you can yeah. tell us more about? Yeah, that's, that's, yes, that's correct. So I'm the scientist, so I'm just, you know, my job is just use the science that I know to help conserve the species. So if you watch the film, you know, that, that the populations of red wolves that in North Carolina actually coming from the, the captive breeding programs and you know, without any of these captive breeding program intern populations you now re reintroductions are not going to happen so therefore to preserve to maintain this healthy i mean overall health and also genetic health of the captive populations is very is key for the species of, for species survival because you know we still get try to get extinction because as Alex said you know right now we have less than 20 red wolves out in North Carolina so the future of red wolves is depend on these 200 plus wolves that around breeding centers zoos across the United States. And I know that the Fish and Wildlife Service is starting to do that recovery plan. And hopefully in the long, not really too long future, we'll have the population that we can reintroduce back into the wild. So in the meantime, what we are doing is that use our science to help maintain uh, healthy populations and also preserve genetic through uh, you know, bank, you know, we collect the sperm from wolves that 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 and then freeze them in our our uh, bank and then later on even after one particular wolf really pass away we can use that sperm or genetic material to produce to reintroduce uh, that founder genetics back into the population, so make uh, there was that genetically diverse population that way. So you keep uh, a, a bank of genetic material. Yeah, we we don't have we don't have the bank at SCBI, but we're working with the Red Wolf Species Survival Plan. So every year, my postdoctoral fellow and, and I would to as we went out to different breeding centers to collect sperm and, and bank them for the Fish and Wildlife Service so future, for future use, yes. I imagine it's a, a little complicated to, uh, to track um, where those samples are coming from and, and distribute them in such a way that you're getting the right, uh, I guess, mix um, with, um, how should I say it? You're distributing the, the genome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, well, we have, we know what the, you know, sample, where who's donated the sample. So we can track the pedigree that way. So it's, it's possible that we can use, you know, reproductive technologies as artificial insemination to use those um, sample when we need them. And how long would the uh, the genetic material be viable? I mean, um, does it get us kind of, for it's, lack of a better word, an insurance lasts, policy? It, well, no, it lasts no as long because the sample will be frozen in liquid nitrogen, which is 100 and 196 degrees Celsius. That's very cold. And at that te low temperature, all that activities and enzymes in the cell stop. So the cell is, you know, we keep adding liquid nitrogen to our storage tank, it can last forever. Like the example is, you know, with the ferret, which is also 
endangered species native to the United States. So we were able to produce the blackfoot ferret kits from sperm that was frozen 20 years ago through artificial insemination. So these cells can last a long time, as long as you maintain those tanks carefully, not just you know, put them there and forget and walk away and then everything is all disappear. So it's, it's a very useful technique, um, that, that technologies to help research in university because some of these, you know, with the with the Blackfoot Ferret story, that you know the that twenty years old sample that we use for produce these kits, those are from the founder that come from the wild when when they pull the last eighteen individual of the Blackfoot Ferret out from the wild. So, wow! Well, it is simply amazing stuff uh, <laughs> that you do. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, the contribution uh, in perpetuity that's, that's come from you to preserve these species. Um, I'm going to stop asking questions because I think other people probably have much more intelligent questions to ask you. Um, so what I'm going to do is bring back uh, Alex and Justin, and we're going to get ready for a little bit of Q&A, if that sounds good to everybody. That sounds um, good. So let me search through all of our wonderful people here <laughs> and find, there we go, I got Alex. There he is. And here comes Justin. And I'm gonna bring in Barbara because what's gonna happen is Katie and Barbara are gonna help me to um, look at the comments and find uh, some questions to bring up with you guys. So, um, Katie, you want to be seen? All right. I'll take a shoulder shrug as a sure, put me on. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, um, have we had any questions in the comments? I've been kind of focused on the screen here. We do have one, and I'll just read it. Um, this is from Amy. She attended the National Wildlife Federation program in Asheville, North Carolina about 20 years ago, and the zoo there had two red wolves. At that time, the farmers were providing pathways for the wolves. She wonders if the farmers have changed their minds. That is a good question. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily that the farmers have changed their minds about the red wolves. I think what has happened within that period of time is that coyotes have become more of an issue locally and in the area. Um, as everyone kind of knows, coyotes aren't necessarily native to this area. They're more found in the desert Southwest, but because the red wolves and the gray wolves and the Mexican wolves have been killed and hunted and extirpated out of their natural habitat, those coyotes have been moving into new habitats and have been moving east. And that's been happening, you know, over the last several decades, but really the coyotes have kind of taken a foothold in on the east coast within the last decade. And so in that period of time, a lot of coyotes has started showing up as red wolf numbers have declined. And I think that's kind of what makes things difficult for the farmers because they want to be able to manage those coyote, the coyote populations and it's difficult to balance the two. Um, and so that's, I think, where it gets a little bit murky. So they're not necessarily changing their minds. It's, it's the fact that the coyotes have showed up in large numbers recently, and that's led to where we're, the situation that we're in today. I think so how do the coyotes and the wolves interact? Are they enemies full time? Are they incompatible? <laughs> That's another good question. Um, so normally the red wolves chase the coyotes away because they're seen as a threat. They're seen as, you know, competition. Um, there are occasional examples of where they could interbreed um, and it gets, it gets weird, but typically they do not want to do that. They do that as an absolute last resort. And so if you have a robust population of red wolves, they're interbreeding with each other and then they're kind of pushing coyotes and other things out of their range. And so that's typically how they would interact. And that's how they've interacted um, within the last hundred years. And before that, they haven't interacted because coyotes stayed over there on the West Coast. And I think to, 
to throw another aspect in there, it kind of was like a perfect storm for, you know, issues that led to the populations to decrease in red wolf numbers. Um, you know, like the coyotes, there was this mistaken identity that's going on. People were wanting to hunt coyotes and, you know, deter these predators from their landscapes. And so a lot of times there was, you know, farmers shooting a, some dog-like creature running through their yard, not realizing that maybe it was a red wolf. But on top of that, you know, like mentioned in the film, there was a pretty big misinformation campaign that started um, years ago. And, you know, population, the numbers in the wild were doing great. You know, they reintroduced them in the late 80s. Population numbers were getting really high. But because of that misinformation campaign and just the things that were happening with the coyote populations and attempts to manage those, um, it just kind of became a perfect storm of lots of negative things happening to the wild red wolf population and their numbers ultimately decreasing because of that. Yeah, and the coyotes around here are a little bit strange. You guys probably know that, but when you look at them in their native habitat, it's a 30 pound animal, 20 pound animal, real small kind of doing its thing. But here they've interbred with a lot of domesticated dogs um, and they're a, a lot larger on the East Coast. So they're a little bit more of a force to deal with. So they're definitely interesting. <laughs> well, I have a twofold question um, for Alex and Justin. So um, first, this is from Emily. How did you get started in wildlife filmmaking? And then to follow up with that, Justenia also wants to know, did you have a favorite candid moment um, while you were filming the wolves that you witnessed? So how did you get started in all of this? Um, and then did you have a favorite candid moment while filming the wolves? Justin, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? No, I don't care. These are both a lot easier to answer than wolf <laughs> Than population dynamics of coyotes <laughs> and red wolves. Um, I can dive into it. I'll give a really speedy version. Um, as a kid, I knew I always wanted to be doing something with wildlife. I had no idea what it was. I think I wanted to be like a doctor, Sang or Sang Sinsen, and like other biologists or veterinarians. And I realized very quickly as I went through school, I am like the absolute worst at math. Um, and kind of the arts were something that I gravitated more towards. And it wasn't until junior high that I watched Planet Earth for the first time. And I was like, people are getting paid to do this. Like, this is a career choice that people have. And it was in that moment that I was like, this is what I want to be doing. Um, and so from there, I went to school for film production and minored in environmental science. And Justin would help me study for my tests before an hour before my <laughs> biology test. Literally that in I the hallway before, before as everyone's ready to go in and take the exam. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I just, I realized that, you know, being kind of a lay person and wanting to tell these stories about wildlife conservation, I could help, you know, scientists in a very small capacity convey maybe a complicated story or, you know, uh, scientific topic in a way that hopefully is educational and really entertaining for people to watch. And so that's kind of where I've hoped to position myself with what we're doing with Running Wild Media. And Justin has a little bit different of a background. And Or I don't know if we want to go into candid moment. Should I do that too? I might steal Justin's. I don't know. Um, You're on the hot seat right I'm now. I'm on the hot seat. All right. <laughs> Everybody told us in the making of this film that the chances of us ever seeing a wild red wolf were like very slim. And when you have a budget, you don't really want to take massive risks, but we knew we like had to get footage of wild red wolves. And I think at the time there were like 11 on the refuge at the, that we were, I don't know if it was 11. I don't, I can't remember, but we had 11 days of shooting in like the winter to try and find red wolves. And we were out in blinds for 50 plus hours each. We were driving around the refuge all day, all like sunrise to sunset looking for red wolves. And there's one shot in the film, I, it's hard to point out in this conversation, but it was a pretty miserable rainy day. And we happened to see two little faces sticking out of the tall grass and immediately saw these two red wolves are just laying on the edge of the tall grass and the conditions were just right that we could hop out get the cameras out and they were really relaxed 
and actually film a couple shots of these wild red wolves, you know, roaming around in the refuge. And that was kind of one of the, the best moments in the, the making of this is to be able to actually say like, we have filmed this animal in the wild. Excellent. <laughs> All right, so I got into wildlife filmmaking, um, I guess through television, because I would watch wildlife films. So when I was younger, I would watch a lot of Jeff Corwin, Jack Hanna on TV. And I also lived in Columbus. So I'd go to the zoo all the time. And I kind of always knew that I wanted to exist in this weird intersection of like wildlife biology and wildlife filmmaking. So I went to zoo school when I was in high school, which was kind of a weird program where I could go to the Columbus Zoo for half the day. And I could take zoology, uh, research, statistics, organic chemistry, and then go to college to study biology. Uh, and that's what I did. So I worked in the marine lab there. I did a lot of really cool projects. Uh, and then Alex and I kind of met up. We, our first project, I think we went to the Columbus Zoo to go film the aquarium there. And so we worked together on a couple projects at the PBS station at Bowling Green. And that's kind of like where we started you know, realizing that this could be a, a really cool thing. And we went down to Costa Rica at the end of our college year or experience to film a wildlife documentary about just whatever we found down there. And that's kind of where this production company formed. We're like, we could film wildlife and talk about science and follow around conservation biologists and like try to make a living out of this. And then while doing that, teach everybody around us that you know, certain animals need protection and allow people to understand how their behavior affects certain ecosystems and how everything kind of pieces together across the world um, so that everybody can live happily and in, in harmony with nature. Um, we're still very far away from that goal, but we're working on it. Um, but that's kind of what motivates me. Like I do have the science background. I've done research projects. I'm doing research now for my master's but really there's this big disconnect between what goes on in the research academic realm and what gets put out to the public. And so I really like in sitting in that area because I understand what's going on in the research world and then I can kind of translate it and then put it out to the public. And then Alex with his experience and his background makes all of the magic happen with like the cameras, the technical stuff, the storytelling, the editing. Um, so it's really, really cool. Um, and then my favorite candid moment, I'll do the opposite of what Alex did. I'll tell you all about the times we didn't film any Red Wolves. <laughs> um, now, there was a couple situations that were funny. We would sit out in a blind. They had this big trailer um, with a giant wooden blind on it. And, and I would sit in that blind for, you know, three hours in the evening and then we'd get out there in the morning and there'd be wolf tracks, fresh wolf tracks all over the blind because they smelled that somebody was in there. And then we get there when the light starts coming up, no wolves at all. We go back to our campsite, we'd be driving, there'd be a fresh wolf turd laying on the road with a bunch of tracks, like they were just there. But we were just there too, but we didn't see anything at all. Um, and then there would be people on the road that were like, yeah, there are wolves right down this road just 30 seconds ago. And then we go down the road and there's absolutely nothing. And we spend like two hours just waiting there, hoping the wolves come out of the grass. So sarcastically, those are my favorite candid moments. <laughs> They're just messing with you with their little turd calling cards there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they knew it. <laughs> they they were looking for them. Good. Uh, here's a question. I think this might be good for Dr. Song to send. It's, um, has there been any consideration of cloning red wolves and being able to release them into the wild? So I don't know about cloning and red wolves and success. I think she's muted. Oh, we need to unmute you, please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so... Cloning is, is one of the technology that we have in our toolbox, but it would be the last resource that because of, you know, in, in canines, all the canine species, wolves, in, you know, dogs, cloning is not, um, it's um, 
not the technology is not there, especially to ap apply to endangered species. But it will be very useful to use if we have technology available in the case that you have a genetically valuable individuals that you cannot get sperm or you cannot get eggs from them. The only way that you can preserve that genetic and take it on to the next generation is through using the cells that come from their uh, body to produce the offspring. But because it's technologics, it's involved, it's, it's very involved. And in the, because of the way we want to conserve the species, as I said before, that we want to have gene diversity. So clone means you make a copy of the same animal, right? So you don't want to have the same copy of wolves running around because you're not going to have any genetically diverse. So if technology available, so yes, we'll have it in our back pocket and use it when it is appropriate. But right now, you know, we there's people still develop that, and then we the technique that would we would use first is to sperm crab preservation, artificial insemination. We call that with the one that it's more likely to attainable in the near future. So this might be a good follow-up question too for you, Dr. Songsess, and this is from Allison. Um, they ask, are the animals in captivity and the stored samples hybrids? And uh, what is the last part of that? Are the animals in captivity and the stored samples hybrids? Like a the coyote? Store, well, they're not hybrid because the one that we have are collecting from the captive population. So they are red wolf samples. So we, we're going to be using that as you know, to produce red wolves in the future. Uh, here's one from Joe. Uh, he says, have you noticed any environmental changes associated with the reintroduction of the wolves similar to the slowing of the erosion uh, and all the um, kind of added words to, to what Joe said here, but you know, there was all these tremendous environmental changes that were catalyzed by the gray wolves in Yellowstone. Did we see that with the red wolves uh, in North Carolina? Do you guys know? Um, I, I'll hop in and I'll say that I would, the data and the research conducted on something like that is probably limited in North Carolina as compared to Yellowstone. Um, but there has been some anecdotal evidence that the wolves are taking out some of the invasive species that are there like the nutria. Uh, so they'll go out and they'll hunt those animals because they are larger rodents. So it's a, a sized more appropriately for what they would be going for. Um, and then there's some evidence that they are helping reduce the diseases that are transferred between certain hoofed animals like deer, um, like brucellosis and things like that. So I don't want to say yes, it has, because I don't think there's that evidence base yet. I don't think as much research and work has been put into it, but I think anecdotally, yes, there's some small changes that people are noticing and picking up on that the wolves, their presence is making a difference in that ecosystem. And I think having a healthier, more robust population and some more data points, I think you would be able to make a case that they would have a very similar effect on the ecosystem that the gray wolves had in Yellowstone. Barbara, are you seeing anything over on Facebook? Uh, no, there, there's people saying, thank you for doing this and saying hello. Um, <laughs> I have a question. I believe I, it was wolves and I believe it was in Russia. And there was something to do with the color of the wolf having something to do with the personality of the wolf. Do you know anything? Do you know enough about the red wolves to know if the colors or size of them has anything to do with their docileness or aggressiveness? I know there was, a, there was a fox study that was fox. done. Okay, got Yeah, about right. domestication. Yeah. Yeah, and so as they domesticated, there was some evidence that showed that their fur would potentially change color, but I don't, 
I'm not educated enough on that study to really be able to talk about it with confidence, but I, that's just kind of my very brief understanding. Um, and it looks, oh, go ahead. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think anything like that has been done with red wolves. They haven't been domesticated. The couple that were in the box together, it, it looked like the eye color was different between the male and the female. Is that just filmmaking or do they have different color eyes? They yeah. Were, <laughs> yeah, they were just different color eyes. Yeah, they are, right? the variation within yeah. between the two animals. He was just a beautiful, like, they both were beautiful in their own right, but I mean, <laughs> That male in particular, like, was so, like, to see him walk out was yeah. awesome, back onto the landscape, so. That was magnificent. So did I understand? You have questions, Todd, of your own. You got questions? I, yeah, I don't know if this, <laughs> I don't want to end on a downer, but. Uh, oh. But what well, we saw at the end of the film was was the two wolves going off together. And did you guys tell me at, at some point what's their status right now? Do you know? Yeah, um, they they are not together currently. That doesn't mean they won't pair in the future, but right now they're not together. Um, and because of reduced. Um, ability to go out and search for the animals because of a lot of the COVID restrictions that are happening right now. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife don't have very consistent uh, location pings on where the animals are. Um, so they're still kind of trying to figure out where uh, the male 2282 is uh, in relation to the, the refuge. So we don't know. <laughs> Well, we'll put our positive thoughts out there and say, dude, go back and find her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Make some more wolves. Because <laughs> that was what? Was that end of February or early March? I can't remember that they released them. It was the very end of February when they released the two. And I think the last time that they were able to go out and find um, location data was in July. So it's been a minute. Yeah, and it, it's completely been disrupted by uh, COVID restrictions, unfortunately. So um, they're doing their best that they can do, uh, given what's going on. But the good news is that they are planning on doing future releases of more red wolves in that area to help create a better, more robust population. So, you know, even if they don't get back together, uh, there is still hope because they will be putting more wolves out there on the refuge. That, that's really cool. Um, that, that makes me think of something. Uh, one of the links that I just put in the comments uh, was a, a link to Red Wolf Coalition, which is one of the organizations that I've really uh, been privileged to connect with um, over the past couple of years as I've become an advocate. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I believe we've got Cornelia Hutt here with us uh, tonight, and she is the chair of their board. The reason that I mentioned them is because they just recently announced, uh, they were part of a, a lawsuit along with a, a couple of others um, that has recently uh, forced the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to um, kind of uh, produce on their plan uh, to reintroduce wolves. They, they were kind of dragging their feet and they weren't releasing, as you mentioned um, earlier, I th what'd you say, about a decade, right? Yeah, um, the last time they released, it was 2009. Yeah, so their 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 uh, feet have been held to the fire uh, to uh, to really put their uh, their efforts back into gear. Um, so that's that's good news. Hey, Todd, I see a um, comment on Facebook from Tom, and it might be a good segue. So Tom says, "I'm worried about habitat degrada degradation and its effects on wolves." and many other species for that matter. Clear cutting of forests, mining, expansion of cities and suburbs, et cetera. Wildlife is certainly at our mercy. At least folks like you are certainly helping with the awareness of this problem. So I don't know if any of you want to speak to that, maybe about um, wolf habitats and whatnot. Yeah, I could speak, speak to that real quick if anybody, if no one else has anything they want to shoot out. I mean, given, with that being said, I think, 
it, it is possible to live with a lot of these animals and to provide habitat for them that they need. Um, there's a lot of cities right now that are looking into green corridors. Um, Alex lives in Toledo and there's a really good corridor there, the Blue Ribbon, that connects a bunch of state parks and metro parks and areas together. Um, so linking these areas and being smart about how we plan our urbanization, I think is a really good way to be able to make room for a lot of these animals that are being pushed out because we're literally just building wherever we feel like building. But if we're smart about it and we think about how to integrate wildlife areas and like native grasses into our neighborhoods and corridors that connect metro parks and state parks, um, even looking at overpasses or underpasses for wildlife bridges <laughs> to prevent road mortalities. If we're smart about urban planning, I think it's possible to build cities and areas that can co cohabitate both wildlife and humans safely. So. And I think on that note, um, you know, there's a lot of efforts around the United States to restore ecosystems. And like Justin mentioned here in Northwest Ohio, or in oh, just Ohio in general, um, you know, 95% of the wetlands that existed along the southern Lake Erie shore had been filled in for agriculture. And there's actually a really large push in Northwest Ohio to restore some of these wetlands and, and buy agricultural fields and flip them. But, you know, wildlife is resilient. And if you, wherever you are, help to be involved with or lead initiatives to restore ecosystems, they find ways to get back. It's very surprising, but you'll find that animals are, they're looking for that opportunity to, to get into these habitats. And so any effort, I think, to restore ecosystems and, you know, manage what exists are, are huge because they'll make their way back if we give them the opportunity and the, the land to do so. Resilience. <laughs> Story of the American Red Wolf. Boom. <laughs> I like how you snuck that word in there. <laughs> I didn't mean to, it was not planned, but. Yeah. Life finds a way. <laughs> no, they wanna survive, so they'll make it happen as long as we give them an opp opportunity to. Was that the impetus behind the, the title of the film? Yeah, it was uh, to show that, you know, they went extinct once in the wild, they were brought back, and now they're on the verge again. They're a resilient species, they've hung on, and so the idea is to, like, show that they're able to keep hanging on and they're going to make it through another, you know, in, into the future, um, given that they're supported and the conservation programs are allowed to undergo. So that was the idea, yeah. The efforts of all the, the conservation institutions and places like Smithsonian and what Dr. Song Sanson are doing, I mean, that's, they've, that's the reason that they were able to make it back the first time. And, you know, without people like her, there would be no, no chance for this. So we're grateful that she could join us. Thank you. Oh, no, she's muted. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh, yeah, I was going to try to say something about the um, coexisting. I think that creating the corridors and things are great. And, um, but I think that we need to, to advocate, I think, like, um, educate people, involve a community that going to be living with, with the wildlife, especially if you're talking about wolves, you know, and People think, oh, we're gonna have wolves in your backyard. Most of people is like, no, you don't want wolves, right? So I think there's a lot of outreach and communication. I think is key, and and I know that um, Fish and Wildlife Service, we we have been working with with them, and then they're trying to they're working on the recovery plan right now. So it's gonna take some time because. It's not that, okay, boom, we're going to reintroduce red wolves because you know, if we do not get communi community engaged, it's gonna be a failed program. So a lot of tax payer money gonna go in into the program that not gonna be successful. So it has to be a lot of planning where gonna be the good habitat, how we need to get community involved, understand and wanting to have wolves to be released into their um, backyard particular you know, and also you know how many animals we need to release 
how to build up the captive populations to big enough to sustain the one that we have and as an interim population and also to support the reintroduction because you know if you release animal out you're going to have um, uh, some uh, mortality and then you're going to have to keep releasing them to until the population is big enough to sustain so it's just a lot of plan a planning process and um a few years ago we we host um workshop red wolf workshop where we invite a lot all the stakeholder UH Fish and wildlife service universities ngo come in and and talk about this and then since then has been a great collaboration across so people who work with wolves in the field like someone like Joe, they really care deeply about the species. So, you know, I, I just want to shout out to them because a lot of people batching, you know, fish advisors service and not care about wolves, you know, because I, I feel like people like Joe who working closely to the species need support from us, you know, knowing people, knowing that they work really hard to save those species. So I just want to, to point it out. You know, not all of them are bad. <laughs> Maybe the one at the top, but the one that you know, working with the species, they are they really do care. Yeah. With that being said, we've seen a lot of passion with the people we've been working with in U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They're really, really supportive of this program, and they're doing everything that they can to make it work. They love these wolves. Um, so, like she said, it's coming from the very, very top. It's making yeah. it for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, any other other comments or questions? All right, uh, I think what we'll start doing is uh, wrapping things up. I put a few um, <clears throat> links in the comments. Uh, I put the one in there for Red Wolf Coalition and what Red Wolf Review is a really excellent website if you want to know more about uh, the wolves uh, as a species, uh, the efforts uh, to restore them, there's just a lot of really good information um, there. And you can follow them on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, I stuck my stuff in there um, if you want to follow along. My, my contribution as, to this is as a storyteller, uh, especially to a younger generation. Uh, that's, uh, that's how we start to connect uh, with, with the public and start reshaping. For me, my passion is to take the, uh, the, uh, the myth of the big bad wolf and reverse that. Uh, so that's, that's my challenge. Um, and so I stuck my, uh, my stuff in there too, if you wanna follow along with, uh, with progress on that. Um, so uh, we're gonna wrap up tonight, but what I'd like to do uh, for those of us on Zoom, uh, if our guests have a little bit more time and for those who want to remain around uh, is once we officially end things, we're gonna uh, kind of for a few minutes, uh, unmute everybody and just let people hang out uh, in kind of an unstructured way uh, and just see how that goes. Uh, for those of you who are following us on Facebook, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you participating. Uh, and we are going to say good night to you at this point. So thanks again for being a part of this program. Thank you. I'm giving Katie a moment to do her thing. To open the floodgates. Open the we're floodgate. all set. Tomatoes cannot come through the screen, so you're okay. All the spam <laughs> bots. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of thanks in the comments and then on Facebook too. Um, but I'm glad it was an enjoyable and entertaining and educational evening for all of us. So, Yeah, thank you again for having us. Yeah, it's been fun. Good. That's very important. Oh, so yeah. what's next? Are you going back filming? Are you going to go back to some of the places you filmed before, locations? 
Ooh. None of it. it depends. <laughs> That's a, <laughs> we're trying to do all of it right now, Okay. <laughs> but it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Times are challenging right now. We would love to be out filming. Yeah. We had a lot of countries on our list for this year. We had to, had to postpone or cancel. So we're hoping to make up for it next year with continuing some of our projects, but we've been kind of focusing a lot more on stuff that we find in our own backyards. Um, Alex went out and was doing some really amazing photos with um, some owls yesterday, the day before. Um, so that's been super cool. I went out to Snake Road and got some photos of not snakes, but frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Plot twist. Um, so that's been kind of nice, being able to look at our own backyard and kind of really hone in on some of the species that you wouldn't necessarily get to spend a whole lot of time with because you're out filming out in other countries but definitely itch, in, itching to get out there and can continuing working on a lot of our projects i'd like to um ask a question more about i'm the one that was down in the national wildlife area okay. um, i seem to remember in that class that they tried to reintroduce the wolves um in the Appalachians, um, around in that area, and they basically starved out. Is 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 my memory correct? They had a disease, I believe. Uh, I don't think it was starvation. I think it was a disease that they eventually succumbed to um, out there, and that was in the Smoky Mat Smoky Mountain National Park that right. they released. And it was a very small release, kind of an experimental release. Um, but I believe that's what ended it. Mm -hmm. they decided not to go there again with future populations. Yeah, I, I'd heard they'd, they'd released them in the higher elevations and then they fairly quickly migrated to the lower farmlands. Is that right? Or I'm not totally sure. With the smoky mountain. Yeah, I hadn't heard that they had actually gotten ill. Wow. And when you release the two wolves, was the first one the male or the female? The first one just didn't want to kind of go anywhere, and the second one <laughs> took like crazy. When, when they uh, released the wolves uh, out in Yellowstone, well, they had kept them in an enclosure for a while, but when they released them, whew, you know, they just took off like crazy. So which sex got out first when you did it? The male left first. Uh -huh. it's the power of movie magic editing it makes oh. it all happen within 60 <laughs> seconds but i think what justin it took 45 minutes or more for the male to leave oh i can't remember the and then the female oh. just took off because that was that because he was out there yeah eventually she yeah That's like why it was so dark when we started filming it was not that dark and then we all just sat in the field and it was like an onion field. So it just smelled like onions for like four hours. <laughs> and we sat and waited for these wolves to run out. Yeah, and the, the, the thing is the, the female lived there. So she was very used to the habitat and like what to do, where to go. And so when she came out of the, the den, she sprinted right for that filter strip, strip and then kind of ran alongside, but the male his whole life, he's been seeing white sand and palm trees. And so when he walked out into that field, he's like, what is this? This is weird. And so he was a little bit more yeah. uh, cautious about moving around, which was kind of fun to watch. I was uh, paper involved with the release uh, of the Yellowstone wolves. And I just had to go see them. And I went to the Lamar Valley. Mm -hmm. I spent almost a week there. Never saw a wolf. I was really disappointed. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Not heard or saw one. But, oh. you know, the first time I'd heard the, the regular wolves, not the red ones, was in our national zoo. Uh, I was there with the seminar, um, Smithsonian seminar group, and the siren went off right next to the uh, zoo, and the two wolves just started howling like crazy. So I did finally get to hear live wolves howl. That's amazing. Well, if it makes you feel any better, when Alex and I were in Yellowstone, we saw gray wolves on our second day. <laughs> that really makes me feel good. 
<laughs> we were very lucky. We were told. I'm checking out. I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> did you, what time of year did you go? Uh, summertime. Oh, there were cameras all over the place. I mean, you couldn't oh, yeah. get, get in close. We were in a bus. So I was above the people with the cameras. And they made a special trip for me. It was a... Uh, what's it called? Oh, it's a special group that will go on tours wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they took me there. It didn't work. Oh, well, if you get a chance to go again, what I what we've been told is winter is the best time to see. Well, that. maybe for the wolves, but not for the people. <laughs> it is very cold. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was that. when we went and got the gray wolf footage. We were pretty much told, you know, it was going to be really hard to see them not in winter. And we spent, I think, 10 or 11 days there and we saw them throughout the winter, but it was very, very, it was negative 40 like most yeah. mornings without wind. So it was just negative 40. Um, but it was, it was awesome to see, you know, we got there right after they had made a kill. So yeah. we were, we just had to kind of sit and wait, and they came back. Yeah. Yeah. There's a place out there called Wolf Haven. I, my spouse took me to all these wolf places. And then there were other places where they're hybrid, half dog and half wolf, and they had them all chained up outside. It, it, it was very unpleasant, and they were really awful, awful animals. What's your opinion of that? Oh, my chair's squeaking. Uh, I mean, I prefer wild animals. Um, I think that there's definitely some places out there that kind of slap a wolf label on some things and turn them into tourism opportunities. But and just, yeah, yeah, there's unfortunately a lot of cases of that happening all around the world where you know these animals are being exploited for just money. You know, we all saw Tiger King, <laughs> so. I mean, yeah. anytime you, I think, have the opportunity to support one of the institutions that's involved in like the species survival plan of red wolves or gray wolves or in the, the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, those are usually really good facilities. If you do want to see something like that, um, like an animal, like captive animals, those are the places to support who are usually work like the National Zoo, like working to preserve species in the wild and conserve animals. I just remembered another place we visited. It was the Nest Purs. Is that how you pronounce it? The Indians? Nest Nest Pierce. Pierce. They, Pierce. They had a very large, uh, very large enclosure with about 15 wolves. In or in Oregon, Eastern Oregon? Is that where uh, you are? Somewhere out there. I, I don't remember. We just toured a whole bunch of places. Yeah. We do have a comment about the what killed out the red wolves from Deborah Staples said parvo was the problem for the Smokies red wolves. Per the late Chris Lukash, parvo virus from domestic dogs was likely part of the reason the GSMP red wolves died out. Oh, thank parvo you. Yeah. And I'm gonna- That was Deborah, those thank you. Who might not know, uh, Chris Lukash uh, was a fish and wildlife uh, biologist. Okay. And there's actually, maybe you guys have seen it there's a documentary uh that was made i believe they started the filmmaker started out making it about red wolves but it, it kind of became a story about chris yeah. um because he uh contracted lou garrett's disease and so there's wow. this parallel between what's happening with the wolves and what was happening in his own life as he lived out his final years uh really moving stare down fate is the name of the documentary and if for those of you who are still with us, uh, if you get a chance to watch that, I'd highly encourage it. Hmm. And speaking of um, Virginia, which is uh, where Hanley Regional Library System is, uh, we're located at the top of the uh, Shenandoah, top of the state, lower Shenandoah Valley. If you that doesn't make sense to you, ask me. Upside I down. <laughs> the river, it's the river's fault. The river goes downhill north. We're the lower <laughs> valley, yeah. Making this the lower valley at the top of the state. But that's Crazy. not my uh, What I was gonna bring up uh, is that we have, I think, two uh, participating facilities that are part of the Red Wolf Species Survival Plan. One's in Roanoke. Uh, and I'm 
can't remember where the other one is, uh, but uh, Virginia has two of them, so that's kind of cool. Oh, it's the um, it's the Virginia Zoo, I think is what it's called. So find it on a map and go visit wolves. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How did these uh, the red wolf, gray wolf, genetically? How are they different? I can, yes. That might be a good question for Dr. Song Sanson. Oh, okay. I'm just a lowly filmmaker. <laughs> I think she's muted. Oh. Is she yeah, trapped? I mute myself because my dog barks. So I just want to. And then I can't get back. They are different. They have, um, well, they are. Closely, well, if you think about dog, domestic dogs. So if they're domestic dogs, gray wolves, red wolves, coyote, they are in the same group, but they are different species, but they are closely related and therefore they can interbreed and then produce fertile pups. So they would have um, red wolves based on the genetic studies. So they based from the United States, don't know they endemic from here, and the gray wolves that kind of come out from the Europe and then the northern part. So they're not really, um, so they, are, they have these distinct genetic signature, I would say, that would make them separate species. Did that answer your question? No, I just don't know where they came from, though. I mean, how? Well, the, well, the red wolves, uh, they, they came from here. They evolved from this region. And the gray wolves did not. Okay. So they are, they are different. They come from different region. Great Red wolves is right here. They evolved right here in the United States. That's why we call them American red wolves, because the hours. So I was wondering if Running Wild Media offers any kind of internships or job opportunities because it's literally my dream job to do what you guys are doing. So I was wondering how I could get started with that. If you want to shoot us an email on our website, um, okay. Yeah, we would love to talk more. We, yeah, we tried to start to. like a, an internship program and it just so happened to coincide with the global pandemic. And oh. <laughs> so we, we ran into some issues initially, but um, you know, we'd be happy to, to chat and point you in the right direction. Okay. And your yeah. emails on your website? Yes. Yeah, there should just be a general. Okay. okay. We just had an intern. Um, who ended up getting college credit from Bowling Green State University. So we oh, worked awesome. out with our, our university to where they would give college credit. So nice. okay. yeah, cool. that. thank you. Yeah. You know, you arrived when. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely, there's tons of opportunities out there to be doing, you know, science communication and wildlife filmmaking and, um, either way we could help direct you to things like that as well to just kind of, expand the opportunities that exist out there. There's some really great resources. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, okay. that's great. Okay, well, Hi. I think I'm gonna wrap things up. Goodbye, everybody. Oh, okay. uh, again, to, uh, to our special guests, I just really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for your time and thank thanks for, for having me. This. Thanks for having us. Nice I thank Alex I, and Justin. Good night. I all. thank Barbara for oh, thank you, Barbara. Thank yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, Amy. Thank Glad you. to come to the TV. Yay. <laughs> Have a good Have one. Have a great everyone. night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. See you guys.